<clears throat> okay, good. So um, uh, this is where we stopped yesterday. So we have basically looked at the journey of a star from uh, the beginning, the formation, uh, starting of the hydrogen burning, and then uh, all the way up to end products, uh, in, uh, ending with, as either a white dwarf or a violent end in a supernova and uh, a compact uh, neutron star. Or if it's very massive, it could even be a black hole. So let's, um, uh, before we go forward, let's pause for a moment and uh, uh, take a recap of what are the essential things that we have learned. We have learned that the large majority of stars we see are in their hydrogen burning phase because uh, that is the phase of life which is longest lasting. And the hydrogen burning lifetime is proportional to one over cube of mass. So therefore the heavier the mass of the star, the shorter is the lifetime. The lifetime of the sun on the hydrogen burning phase is about 10 billion years. And uh, for example, 10 times the mass of the sun will be therefore about 10 million years. So, <clears throat> Massive stars uh, evolve very quickly, they live much shorter time. And uh, these collection of stars burning hydrogen are called the main sequence. Heavier stars on the main sequence have actually lower density, but much higher temperature. So um, <clears throat> the more, um, the heavier stars are more distended and uh, <clears throat> they have the temperatures are uh, somewhat higher at the center and much higher at the surface. Now, we have noticed that the uh, evolution of stars and the structure of stars are uh, intimately governed by the, the virial theorem. And what is the consequence of the virial theorem? We saw that the, uh, as a consequence of the virial theorem, thermally supported stars get hotter as they lose heat. So as the energy escapes from the interior, the star has to contract. And as it contracts, it releases gravitational energy. Half of the gravitational energy is radiated away, but half the gravitational energy adds to the thermal energy at the same, in the interior. And as a result, the, as the energy leaves the star, the star keeps getting more compact and uh, keeps getting hotter. And this, uh, this is why you know, starting from a cooler initial stage, the stars can get hot enough to you know, you know, start nuclear, fu uh, nuclear fusion. And um, as nuclear fusion proceeds, and once it runs out, then the star will get the, at least the core will get even more compact and even hotter and the subsequent series of nuclear burning can start. Then we have looked, we have found this uh, new source of pressure, which is, which comes from degeneracy, which is of quantum origin. It's present even at zero temperature. And the slope of the pressure versus density becomes smaller as the density rises. And uh, when it turns relativistic, it becomes you know, much softer than uh, at um, lower densities at which the material is not relativistic. The degeneracy pressure, in fact, determines the extent of nuclear burning that will happen in the stellar core. The uh, main stages of nuclear burning are hydrogen going to helium, helium going to carbon, carbon going to oxygen, oxygen going to neon, neon going to silicon, silicon going to iron. And how many of these stages will actually occur in the star is determined by the dominance of degeneracy pressure, which of course is determined again by the mass of the star. So therefore, depending on the mass of the star, different extents of this entire nuclear, uh, evolution chain 
is traversed. Now, degeneracy pressure also ends up providing long-term support to uh, evolutionary end products, for example, brown dwarfs, white dwarfs, and partially neutron stars. So neutron stars are held not just by neutron degeneracy pressure, but also nuclear interactions. But partial support comes from uh, degeneracy pressure. And the um, uh, configurations held by degeneracy pressure um, uh, the, um, uh, have the property that the heavier the configuration, the smaller it is. So um, uh, as you pile on more and more mass, the object starts getting smaller and smaller. And uh, um, uh, at some point, the object will cease to exist. And that is the maximum mass that um, uh, the degeneracy pressure can support. So there are these two limits of Chandrasekhar that we came across. One of them says that the degeneracy pressure support not possible above a certain mass, which happens to be about 1.4 times the mass of the sun for white dwarfs. So that goes by the name Chandrasekhar limit. We also saw the Schoenberg Chandrasekhar limit, which tells us that the thermal support of stellar core is not possible if the core mass fraction exceeds a certain value, which roughly for typical stellar parameters is about 15%. So if the core mass exceeds the 15% of the total mass of the star, then the core cannot be supported by thermal pressure anymore. It just you know, contracts and collapses and finds support in degeneracy pressure. So, uh, and that is a key element in deciding uh, how the stellar evolution proceeds. We also saw that uh, <coughs> the mass of the initial star decides what, what is the end product that it is going to leave after the stellar evolution. Uh, roughly uh, between 0.08 to 0.5 solar mass. Below 0.08 solar mass, uh, we probably will get the degeneracy pressure support even before uh, hydrogen burning. So you, know, you get brown dwarfs below that. Between 0.08 to about 0.5 solar mass, you are uh, left with helium white dwarf as the end product. About half a solar mass to about eight solar mass of um, uh, the original ma uh, uh, zero edge main sequence mass leaves uh, carbon oxygen white dwarf as end product. Between eight to 10 solar mass, we uh, have oxygen ion magnesium white dwarfs as um, uh, end products. And uh, the white dwarf masses themselves, here the helium white dwarf is a maximum mass of 0.45 solar mass, carbon oxygen white dwarf uh, exists between 0.45 to about uh, 1.2 solar mass. Most of the white dwarfs that we see in the, our galaxy today uh, have a mass uh, around 0.6 solar mass. And they're uh, almost all carbon oxygen composition. Oxygen neon magnesium white dwarf ring uh, exists in the mass range about 1.2 to 1.4 solar mass. Now, if the white dwarf mass exceeds that, then uh, it cannot uh, remain as a white dwarf anymore. And uh, it collapses to a more compact object. So if the uh, main sequence mass exceeds about 10 to 40 times the mass of the sun, then you are left with um, a neutron star and possibly above about 40 solar mass, you're left with a black hole directly. So these are rough divisions of um, masses. We, uh, uh, the actual division depends on the details and also the composition that the star starts with and so on and so forth. So we have this uh, whole variety of you know, stellar end products that we can generate at the <coughs> end of stellar evolution. And in, uh, the in, uh, meeting that we are in, in uh, mainly concerns itself with in, uh, this stage where uh, in, uh, the role of in, uh, QCD becomes uh, important. So this is, what we get from the uh, typical evolutionary theory of uh, single stars as a function of mass. But as it happens, most stars are not born single. They are 
in binary systems. And the stellar evolution in closed binary systems can uh, significantly alter the course of evolution we have just stated. Because uh, when the two stars are close together, at some stage of evolution, the mass from one star can be uh, transferred to another one. Now, this can be uh, depicted in a, in a fashion using, you know, using the uh, effective potential that uh, you would see in a binary system. So let's sit, go to a binary system and consider of two stars, and the two stars will revolve around each other. So we can go to the center of mass frame and go to the frame where the two stars are stationary. So that means we are uh, uh, rotating along with the binary system. So uh, in that frame, uh, if we uh, look at the effective potential that uh, the test particle will see, that of course consists of this gravitational potential of the two stars, R1 and R2 being the distances from the center of mass, and distances from the centers of these stars, R1 and R2, of the distances of the point at which we're trying to measure the potential from the centers of these two stars. And uh, because we are in a rotating frame, there is a centrifugal force, which can be written as a gradient of a function, which is like this, omega squares R3 squares. So R3 is the distance from the center of mass of the you know, system so in, the, <clears throat> in, the plane, in, in the plane of the equator. So you know, this gives us a function, the derivative of which gives us a centrifugal force. So, you know, Altogether, you have an effective potential which can be written this way. And if we plot this, then uh, you have these you know, various uh, features in this potential. You have the two stars, which are located at these two points where the you know, potential, of course, the gravitational potential goes very deep. Uh, then uh, as you go out from these stars, the centrifugal force takes over and you have this you know, drop in potential as you go away. So that means, you know, if you, you know, put a test particle, there is a force which is outwards. So it will tend to roll over this potential and then you know, move outwards. And that happens due to centrifugal force. So the gravity is, gravity of the combined gravity of the two stars is you know, not you know, dominating the total you know, force, but the centrifugal forces. So you know, for a given angular you know, speed, as you know, as you go further out, the centrifugal force becomes stronger and stronger. So beyond a certain point, it wins. So since the you know, force is repulsive at this point and attractive at this point, so in between it must go through a maximum and there are these Lagrange points where you know, these are turning points in the potential. So there are five Lagrange points which you know, one can identify in this plane. One's between the two stars, which is over here. One is you know, at one end, in, of the line joining the two stars, which is there, another one over here, and then there are two other Lagrange points which are you know, on the line normal to the line joining the two stars. So, so this we call L1, L2, L3, L4, L5. So there are these five Lagrangian points of any you know, binary system. So now let's say the stars you know, are initially bound together by gravity, they're going around each other, and they have a certain radius, which is well within this potential balance. And then they're you know, happily separately you know, you know, undergoing their evolution and uh, orbiting each other. But as you have seen, at uh, some point in evolution, the stellar radius increases dramatically. So let's say this star this is the more massive star. So the more massive star will evolve you know, earlier and its you know, radius will increase at some point in evolution. At the, as the radius increases, it traverses out of this potential well, and it might overflow this you know, level of the you know, first Lagrangian point. So if it overflows the level of first Lagrangian point, mass will go out of this star and fall into this one. So it goes out of this potential well, falls into this potential well. 
that means mass is transferred from this heavier star to the lighter star now once that happens obviously the you know, evolution of both the stars are disturbed the evolution of this star is disturbed because some mass has been taken away from it and evolution of this star you know, is now you know, speeded up by adding more material to it and hence you know, its effective stellar mass having been increased to that of a heavier star so um, correspondingly the end products will then also differ um, compared to what you would have expected if these two stars were evolving um, separately so the, um, here is a example of what might happen let's take two stars <coughs> one is 13 solar mass one is 6 and a half solar mass so you have a mass ratio of a factor of 2 so these two stars initially in you know, evolve you know, separately in an isolated manner but at some point you know, the 13 solar mass star you know, evolves its radius expands and it fills what we call this potential you know, well and that's called the roche lobe so it fills the roche lobe and mass starts getting transferred to this and <clears throat> as the mass starts getting transferred the whole envelope will end up being transferred to the other star and uh, you will be left with the nuclear burning core mainly the helium core which was produced in this star which for a 13 solar mass star would have been a 2.5 solar mass core now because this is an advanced stage of evolution the evolution of the core is by and large decoupled from the evolution of the envelope as we mentioned already as the evolution proceeds the core becomes denser and denser the envelope becomes you know, more and more distended and therefore less dense and you know, a separation occurs between the core and the envelope evolution and so the you know, core sort of starts evolving on its own and the envelope you know, starts reacting to the radiation emitting from the core so now even if you take away the envelope matter the core more or less is already in set is already set in its course of evolution so this 2.5 solar mass helium star will continue to evolve as it was before maybe slightly altered because you know, the amount of you know, shell burning product which would have been added to it has now you know, is now no longer there so therefore the mass of the helium core if no mass had been taken away from it could have been a little higher in, uh, as evolution proceeded but here it will stop at about 2 and a half solar mass it doesn't make a great deal of material difference of you know, what kind of you know, end product it will produce but the envelope which has been which has left this star will now get transferred to this other star so if the mass transfer is conservative let us say that means no mass is lost from the system so total mass remains the same so you had 19.5 solar mass 2 and a half remains here and the 17 solar mass is now the new the new mass of this star that is a major change in the in the, in the configuration of this star so now let's go back and ask if these two stars were evolving separately what uh, end products would they have left as we have uh, just recalled in, in the previous slide a star which is starting out with 13 solar mass on the main sequence is going to leave a neutron star as an end product and the star which is in, starting out with 6 and a half solar mass in the main sequence would leave a carbon oxygen white dwarf as an end product but what happened uh, is the in, uh, in, uh, as a result of the evolution in the binary system this star uh, still has a two and a half solar mass helium core which will lead to a neutron star so after some point this will go supernova a neutron star will be created and um, the mass loss in the supernova and the kick and so on is going to widen the orbit and the, um, so now you have uh, 1.4 solar mass neutron star 
and in the course of evolution the stars lose some mass by star when so some amount of mass would have been lost from, lost from here as well no but before the helium star produces this 1.4 solar mass in, in the neutron star the helium star also in its own course of evolution would have expanded and filled the roche lobe and transferred a little bit of its mass onto the um, um, uh, 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 other companion so the other companion is now slightly more massive compared to um, um, at this stage it's from 17 to it have gone to 17.3 and the rest of the mass has left the system now we have one neutron star which is bound in this binary system to a heavier star which is now 17.3 solar mass so this mass transfer also achieved in the, the in the, in the also achieved the purpose of no, keeping the neutron star bound in the binary system for example if these two stars evolved separately and this 13 solar mass star no, ended as a neutron star without transferring any of its mass to the companion star then there's a large fraction of the mass which would be lost in the supernova explosion from the system and that would disrupt the system the system will not remain bound anymore but since most of the mass has been transferred to the other star and it's sort of kept there for safe keeping so the amount of mass lost in the supernova explosion is actually a very small fraction of the total mass of the system and therefore the system remains bound now in the second in the phase of evolution where this secondary star which was less massive to begin with and now it is more massive this star will evolve and it will fill its own roche lobe it will transfer some um, material onto the um, neutron star and a neutron star accreting material like that will shine in x rays and you will see, you see them as x ray binaries for example but this process can be quite catastrophic when a very massive star starts transferring matter to a much lower mass star the orbit shrinks very rapidly and uh, so neutron star will start uh, uh, rapidly closing in on this uh, other star and actually go through its envelope itself and uh, the um, a common envelope will form surrounding both the stars and this is called a common envelope phase and the neutron star will keep moving in the common envelope phase generate enough friction and heat to uh, actually expel the envelope and then you will be left with the helium core of this star and the neutron star next to each other in a tight binary orbit and that helium core will then uh, at some point explode and leave a neutron star and you now have a system which which has two neutron stars and depending on the um, um, kind of kick asymmetric kick that is generated in the second supernova explosion the um, system can either disrupt at that stage and you have two single neutron stars or it can remain uh, bound in a binary system so you will have uh, um, an old neutron star which has gone through its uh, binary mass transfer evolution and a new neutron star which has just been formed so both you know, um, tied to each other in a binary system and such binary systems are the ones which result in this you know, double neutron star you know, you know, systems you know, for example hull stellar binary pulsar and also the most interesting systems people are after in uh, the in the quest for gravitational wave you know, in searches so you know, because you know, double neutron star merger are one of the key you know, targets you know, as events for studying the you know, properties of neutron stars and various other things that you know, the the merger merge system 
for example, kilonova nucleosynthesis and so on, which you know, such systems can produce. So, stellar evolution closed binary systems can uh, really influence the course of evolution of a star very dramatically. And uh, the mass exchange between components alters the course of evolution. Stellar masses can change, and the orbital separation definitely also changes. So now if we look at uh, the stellar end products, then we will see that um, we you know, listed a rough range of you know, main sequence mass to you know, end product you know, type you know, relation in uh, a couple of slides ago. But that can be significantly altered when you have you know, evolution in binary system. Now this is a you know, diagram. It's a little bit dated, but it you know, captures the spirit of this you know, you know, very well. So um, it's so, um, quite, quite a lot of information in this diagram. So let me just go through it um, um, step by step. So this red line here, according to these calculations, this is one set of calculations by Ecoib and, and uh, collaborators. Um, so according to their calculations, this red line gives you the um, uh, final baryon mass or the, the um, uh, remnant mass at the end of stellar evolution for the primordial mass that the star started with. This red line is for single stars and in the stars in white binaries where mass exchange does not happen. And there we see that in, uh, you have helium white dwarfs up to about in, uh, in, uh, 0.5 solar mass in mass. Then in, uh, once you get to one solar mass, it is, a, it is not you know, plotted below one solar mass here. So once you come to one solar mass, you're already producing carbon oxygen white dwarfs from single stars, which are you know, 0.6 solar mass or more. And then all of these produce carbon oxygen white dwarfs. So go all the way to eight solar mass produce carbon and oxygen white dwarfs and eight to 10 solar mass produce this uh, heavier remnants. So uh, here I think it is about nine and a half or so is their limit where uh, oxygen and magnesium white dwarfs in the, in the, in the maximum mass is obtained, which is 1.4 solar mass. So from here to here, you have oxygen neon magnesium white dwarf and then above that, you have neutron stars. So in the, this red line in these calculations will represent the, the product of single star evolution. You have below, below half a solar mass, which is not shown here. You will have um, helium white dwarf from half a solar mass to about eight solar mass. You have carbon oxygen white dwarfs. And from eight to about 10 solar mass, you have oxygen neon magnesium white dwarf. And above that, you have neutron stars. But if you look at the you know, stellar products in uh, binary systems, then you have you know, an altered range. Up to about two, two and a half solar mass, you could produce helium white dwarfs. Then the carbon oxygen white dwarfs are produced for initial mass is larger than that to all the way up to maybe you know, 10 solar mass or more. Then you have oxygen and magnesium white dwarfs you know, going up to you know, higher masses. And then you have you know, neutron star progenitors for even higher masses. So you know, by and large, the remnant mass for a given uh, initial mass of the star for the low mass branch has reduced. The high mass branch, it uh, catches up with the uh, single star evolution. So, uh, but all the products that 
you will generate from these binary systems because of the mass transfer out of the star would you know, be reduced in the you know, final nonetheless and so you know, once you have a closed binary system of course these are you know, these values will depend on the you know, separation the mass ratio and so on in the binary system so this is basically these are this can be seen as two boundaries the component masses will lie between this red line and the black line black line and you know, that diversity will be you know, determined by the binary parameters so you know, so you can see that there is a whole range of different outcomes that you, know, you can get in a binary system and that is important in you know, understanding the you know, stellar evolution so we will leave binaries over here and then uh, we will go on to the you know, <coughs> You know, compact object in a little bit more detail. You know, I'm not. I'm deliberately not spending a lot of time on uh, the you know, equation of state or structure or anything of the neutron star, you know, because you, know, you will see and hear a lot many more talks in this meeting devoted exactly to that subject. So I'm basically trying to you know, lead you up to the you know, formation of it and then just give you um, you know, a brief. In the introduction to the in the interior of neutron stars. Okay, so in the, let's look at what happens when you have a white dwarf and you keep adding mass to it, and the, you exceed the, the Chandrasekhar mass limit. So once you exceed the Chandrasekhar mass limit, the electron degeneracy pressure is no longer sufficient to support the white dwarf against the, gravity. so the configuration will start to condense will start to collapse in, uh, under its own gravity which means its density will start increasing as its density starts increasing electrons which are already relativistic now in, uh, it's in their in, uh, um, fermi fermi energy has exceeded Let's say 511 keV, which is the rest mass of the electron. As you squeeze it further, Fermi momentum will further rise, and the electron energy will keep increasing. So, at some point, the electron energy will increase above one MeV. And why is one MeV important? No. One MeV is roughly the mass difference between the rest mass of the neutron and the rest mass of the proton, and this has a crucial consequence. And look at a neutron which is in free space. If you take the rest mass of the electron and rest mass of the proton and add them up, the total mass is less than the mass of the neutron so a neutron can spontaneously decay into a proton and an electron thereby reducing the total mass of the system total energy of the system and a neutrino is produced and all together they share the total rest mass of the neutrons neutron that will decay on the other hand if i take this electron energy level and then keep pushing it up up and up so that it's gone up much higher than it was because of configuration being more dense then what will happen is protons and electrons if you add the two energies that is now higher than the rest mass energy of the neutron so then it will become energetically favorable for these two to combine and produce a neutron and a neutrino right so you had proton electron and anti neutron over here but here you will have the electron and proton combining to produce a neutron and a neutrino so 
So this is called inverse beta decay. So inverse beta decay becomes prevalent when the density of the material becomes uh, higher than a certain you know certain value. Okay, so this is something we are talking about where there are free protons, electrons, and uh, the uh, Fermi energy of the electrons are high. But if I'm looking at the core that is produced at the end of the stellar you know, nuclear burning, so let's say it is an iron core, and so that is the one which is now going to contract and collapse because its mass has exceeded the Chandrasekhar limit. We do not have uh, protons and, and neutrons running freely in the in the, in the system. Protons and electrons are locked up in uh, in iron nucleus, and in, uh, but there are you know, free electrons which are present everywhere. So as this configuration collapses, by virial theorem, its temperature also rises. Its, uh, its, its temperature will keep rising as um, the uh, material contracts. So the local density of photons and in local density of energetic photons keeps increasing. And an interaction between this photon bath and the iron nuclei that has that have been produced starts producing what's called photo dissociation so uh, you take this iron nucleus which was produced through all this nuclear fusion and then bombard them with this energetic photon bath the iron nucleus is going to disintegrate and you know, the products are going to further disintegrate and so on eventually leaving you know, free protons neutrons and you know, uh, out of the uh, out of the nucleus so basically all the work that was done in uh, producing this bound nuclei and then generating energy in uh, uh, powering the stars until now is all undone in this process so uh, you take this bound nuclei and then bombard them with you know, photons and then you are back with uh, protons and neutrons which are free now once that happens these protons can then start combining with the ambient electrons and then start producing neutrons so this matter is now going to get more and more neutron rich as the material becomes more and more condensed now um, if you leave this material uh, let's let it cool down let's uh, try to get the equilibrium composition uh, out of this uh, mixture of nuclear material and then you will produce nuclei yes in, uh, in uh, mass number and in, uh, atomic number in, uh, at different densities so the equilibrium composition of nuclei at different densities you know, is called this cold catalyzed matter where you know, there is no thermal effect that is taken into account and in each of these you have this beta equilibrium which is maintained where the chemical potential of the neutron is equal to the chemical potential of the proton plus chemical potential of the electron and you know, where the chemical potential is defined by square root of fermi energy squared plus you know, c squared plus you know, rest mass squared c to the power of 4 so that is the definition of the you know, chemical potential in each of these so you know, the equilibrium of nuclear composition can then be derived by combining you know, this the mu with uh, nuclear mass formula including shell effects and you know, as you go to higher and higher densities you find that the equilibrium composition keeps changing so this is a over z so um, mass number divided by atomic number so um, as you can see as you go to higher densities the material starts getting more and more neutron rich because for a given uh, um, charge number the atomic number keeps increasing as you 
move to uh, densities above about 10 to the power of you know, 12 grams per cubic centimeter, nuclei bec become incapable of holding all the new neutrons that you are generating. So it becomes uh, possible for the neutrons to exist freely outside nuclei as well. So this is called the neutron drip point. So uh, above a certain density, you have a mixture of uh, neutron rich nuclei plus also free neutrons outside them. Then as you go to even higher densities, these nuclei themselves you know, start losing their identity and um, beyond the nuclear saturation density, nuclei themselves cease to exist and everything merges into a sea of neutrons, protons and electrons. And much of the interior of the neutron star is composed of this kind of material. It's a sea of neutrons, protons and electrons. There is a thin part outside. Uh, let's say the neutron star is about 10 kilometer in radius. So uh, about uh, outer 10% of the radius is occupied by material which does have nuclei. And uh, this, uh, this region is called the crust of the neutron star. So <clears throat> we'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, here is an uh, illustration of what happens uh, if in constructing the neutron star, you ignore the effect of nuclear forces. So if you ignore the effect of nuclear forces, then you will have a structure support by pure neutron degeneracy for which the equation of state is very easily written from the you know, uh, Fermi, you know, Fermi pressure. And you use that along with this you know, tolmar oppenheimer volkoff equation and produce a mass radius relation. And you will see that the maximum mass that you can sustain with pure neutron degeneracy is about 0.7 solar mass. And this is known as the oppenheimer volkoff limit who already worked this out in 1939. So if nuclear forces were not there in neutron stars, then maximum mass of the neutron star would have been 0.7 solar mass. And this would have caused a paradigm shift in the progression of stellar evolution because you have white dwarf maximum mass, <coughs> which is about 1.4 times the mass of, mass of the sun. And you can proceed to a more dense state only after overcoming that you know, mass barrier. So you need to you know, make the degeneracy pressure supported configuration larger than 1.4 solar mass before it can collapse to you know, higher densities. But if the neutron star mass limit were only 0.7 solar mass, then such a you know, collapsing configuration could never find its uh, equilibrium as a neutron star. So it would go straight to a black hole. So in fact, the neutron stars, as you know them, would not have existed if you know, only neutron degeneracy pressure was responsible for supporting neutron stars. But you know, they are not the only you know, source of pressure. The, so this is where the, the nuclear forces become important. So nuclear forces are vital to you know, the existence of neutron stars. So in realistic, realistic neutron stars, the nucleons are squeezed within interparticle distance of you know, about one Fermi. And at that distance, strong nuclear forces become important you know, you know, as a contributor to the equation of state. And the you know, nature of this force, particularly at very high density, is still not known. And hence, we have an uncertainty in the equation of state. But we know that at very short distances, nuclei will have a repulsive nature of the potential. And this repulsive nature of the potential produces additional support against gravity. And, and this repulsive strong interaction adds to the you know, degeneracy pressure and then produces the net you know, support against gravity in neutron stars. So that raises the upper mass limit beyond uh, 0.7 solar mass for pure degeneracy to significantly higher values. How much higher? That will depend on the details of the equation of state, which we don't know yet. The reason why we don't know this from laboratory experiments is that it is almost impossible to create neutron star-like conditions in the laboratory. We can probe 
uh, the nature of the force act in uh, very short distances you know, for example in uh, energetic colliders but they are also you know, uh, accompanied by very high kinetic energy per particle so there is a high temperature high density region which you can uh, uh, probe in accelerators uh, then so this is the, this is density basically this is in the, the nuclear saturation density is a six times nuclear saturation density and in the vertical axis is uh, temperature so we can put in the probe high density high temperature you know, material we can probe low density high temperature material but high density low temperature material is not possible to you know, access using terrestrial laboratories and they occur only in, in neutron star matter nuclei themselves are somewhere in the middle over here so you know, we don't know exactly what the nature of the neutron star matter is experimentally so we have to rely on measurements that occur in uh, other regimes where we can measure and then extrapolate the results to uh, the neutron star regime and these extrapolations always can have uncertainties and that's is the main cause of uncertainty in the equation of state of neutron stars a large number of different models have been devised to describe matter in the neutron star regime all of which will reproduce whatever is known in the laboratory condition but extrapolate the results differently to the neutron star regime so it is hoped then that the astrophysical observations of neutron stars will provide the necessary constraints on the nature of strong interaction in the core dense matter regime that means you need to measure the properties of neutron stars to learn about the strong interaction and that is the goal of all these studies no as you will uh, definitely you know, see in all the discussion that you know, goes on in this meeting so for neutron stars what observables can actually be accessed by us we can measure the masses of neutron stars with some great difficulty we can measure you know, radius in some of these cases of neutron stars you know, with significant uncertainty in some cases of neutron stars we can actually measure the oscillations of the star if you, you know, excite the neutron star in a major way then it undergoes its fundamental oscillations so that can be measured in some cases we can measure the, the tidal deformability of the neutron star in uh, when the two neutron stars are merging with each other or a neutron star black hole is merging and in the from the gravitational waves that we receive we can have a measure of the deformability of the neutron star all of which depend on the equation of state so therefore once we have collected a diverse set of measurements for using various instruments hopefully we will be able to put better and better constraints on the nature of the strong interaction in this cold in a dense matter regime Uh, talking about mass and radius uh, as i said there are many different equation of state and these different equations of state predict different radi uh, relations between mass and radii and uh, measurement of masses for example can rule out some of them so this is one of the earlier diagrams where uh, there are various different uh, equations of state which were uh, prevalent at that time but then um, just the measurement of a mass of a heavy object like this rules out some of some of these in the equations of state which predict maximum mass below this value but there are many other equations of state which will still survive the, above the, the highest measured mass that we have today so we could distinguish between these equations of state if we are able to measure not only the mass but also the radius so for a given mass the radius predicted by these different uh, equations of state are quite different so if we are able to measure both mass and radius of a neutron star 
and that would be you know, a very major step towards uh, you know, isolating some equations of state. Unfortunately, we are not quite there yet. The radius measurements are not good enough to you know, put a very strong constraint. But you know, what we do know is that some of the softest equations of state are ruled out by present day observations. And you know, Um, uh, gravitational wave uh, measurements of tidal deformability is also adding to that result. I will not go to the um, uh, go to those results in uh, in this talk. You will hear, I'm sure, other lectures which you know, um, uh, tell you about these equation of state constraints. Uh, I will just you know, conclude with you know, a description of the interior of the neutron star. So, you know, as I said, you know, the neutron star. You know, interior is at a density which is in, uh, above the nuclear saturation density nuclear saturation density being here 2.4 times 10 to the power of 14 grams per cubic centimeter and then uh, this red line this is for a, in a, in a certain natural indication of state this red line um, gives you the um, density as a function of radius in the neutron star and uh, here is the core the mm, density here is about 10 to the power of 15 grams per cubic centimeter and as you come to the surface which is roughly about 11 kilometers in, uh, in size over here the density drops to about a million grams per cubic centimeter so the mm, uh, lowest density near the surface is about million grams per cubic centimeter and the material there is iron now below this density uh, which is the nuclear saturation density you do have the presence of nuclei so uh, above this density all the nuclei dissolve and you just have a sea of neutrons protons and electrons but below this density that is this part you do have presence of nuclei and below this neutron drip line all the neutrons protons are you know, you know, locked up in nuclei above this line there are nuclei all protons are locked up in nuclei some neutrons are locked up in nuclei and you know, and remaining neutrons are you know, free in the material you know, in the, as like a neutron sea so this is the neutron drip point so the crust that we define cover this entire region where nuclei exist but the crust is now divided into two parts the outer crust where there are no free neutrons and the inner crust where there are nuclei plus free neutrons these neutrons interact among themselves with strong interaction at a distance the strong interaction is strongly attracted and the protons interact among themselves also by strong interaction and at a distance they're you know, strongly attractive the temperature in this in the configuration is it could be as high as a million electron volts when it is formed and then over time it drops to about maybe you know, 10 to the power of 8 kelvin or so which is very hot but because of this strong attraction between neutron and neutron and proton and proton they can form in a cooper pairs and form a, a superfluid or superconducting configuration and the gap energy of these configurations are 1 million electron volt or more right so in a, in a particularly for neutrons and for protons it could be a, a tenth of electron volt or so a tenth of a million electron volt or so since the temperature eventually drops below that so uh, neutrons can combine you know, through this uh, pairing process and produce a superfluid so the superfluid can exist to this entire region where free neutrons exist so that is you know, certainly the core and part of the crust and superconducting protons also coupled through a similar process exist 
uh, in the core because there are no free protons in the crust. So you don't have a superconducting phase in the crust, but the protons in the interior you know, form a superconducting phase. So this nuclear superconductivity is in fact the highest TC superconductor that you will ever come across. So if we now put it all together and then look at you know, what is the you know, total composition and structure of a neutron star. So you have mass about one and a half solar mass and you have a core which is this gray region over here including this you know, darker region and this outer blue region is the crust and the crust has nuclei and as you go deeper and deeper into the crust the nuclei form in excuse me the nuclei in, from being uh, regular spherical nuclei that we know about, they start getting deformed, start assuming asymmetric shapes, and then they can become like rods or you know, plates and things like that. And eventually, as you move into this core region, the nuclear dissolve altogether. So you, know, you have a mixture of free neutrons and nuclei in the inner crust and the nuclei undergo this kind of transformation and eventually dissolve. You have a neutron superfluid which covers the entire region where free neutrons exist and the proton superconductor in the core. Neutron stars rotate, now, rotate very rapidly. Now, the spin ranging from a millisecond to in several seconds. Superfluid neutrons, which carry most of the mass of the neutron star, if they have to rotate, they can do so only by creating vortices in themselves. So in the, the neutron superfluid is therefore penetrated by a large number of vortices. The total number of vortices is about 10 to the power of 15 or 10 to the power of 16. So those vortices then uh, carry the angular momentum of the superfluid neutrons. The neutron stars are also strongly magnetic. Their magnetic field is very high. Um, for pulsars, we know the magnetic fields on an average is about a teragauss and ranging from 10 to the power of eight to 10 to the power of 15 gauss or so that we know of neutron stars. So this magnetic field, if it has to be carried in the interior where the protons are superconductors, then the magnetic field cannot be carried like a uniform uh, distribution inside, the, uh, inside this material because in the superconductor will prevent that um, from happening. But it can be carried by this superconductor in the form of you know, quantized fluxoids. So, this, so you have a mixture of quantized vortices in neutrons and quantized fluxoids in, uh, in protons, which coexist in the same space in the core. And you have these fluxoids and you know, vortices which, they can, uh, which can interact with each other and then can produce a very rich kind of you know, dynamics which couples the spin of the star to its magnetic field. We'll not go into that today, but you know, if you're interested, there is you know, significant literature on it. One can. You know, one can pick up on that. The neutron vortices you know, exist, as I said, also in a region where nuclei coexist with that material. So these neutron vortices can pin themselves to some of these nuclei. Because once a nucleus gets into the core of the vortex, its uh, total energy is you know, altered. So you know, uh, uh, vortex can find a more suitable place to stay by you know, anchoring themselves to nuclei. So it will take some effort 
to jiggle them out of this uh, uh, anchoring. So this is what we see manifest in the process of spinning down of neutron stars. So why does the neutron star spin down? When, because of a strong magnetic field, it has a highly active magnetosphere. And this highly active magnetosphere produces ultra relativistic charged particles and strongly beam broadband radiation, for example, in pulsars. And this takes away the rotational energy of the neutron star. So the rotational energy is lost, so therefore the neutron star spins down. So the spinning down of the neutron star, which is happening due to this electromagnetic torque, which has been produced by the magnetosphere, is felt in the interior. And this is transmitted through the electrons, which couple in this entire star. So this will require the neutron star, the bulk of the neutron star to spin down. The neutron stars can, and the neutron superfluid can only spin down if the vortices migrate outwards. As long as the vortices stay pinned to their original positions, that component of the superfluid, which in a, uh, the, uh, ro the rotation of which those vortices represent, in this case, the crustal neutron superfluid. That component will not spin down un uh, unless you are able to force this thing out. So you have material which is not pinned, which is, in the, which, in the, in the, is subjected to this um, force which is transmitted by electrons which spins down, and this vortex system does not spin down. So there is an angular velocity differential that builds up between the vortex and its ambient superfluid material. And this causes a force on the vortices. It's called the Magnus force. And this you know, force, once it builds up beyond a certain point, can cause a sudden decoupling of vortices, and then the vortices will now migrate. So in this part of the you know, superfluid will spin down, and then you know, you know, the migrated vortices pin at new sites. So this kind of jerky behavior in the spin down of the neutron star is known as neutron star glitches. And these are routinely seen. And maybe you know, some of that might be discussed in this meeting or maybe not, I don't know. But you know, this is also very characteristic behavior of the neutron stars. And that almost clinches the evidence of the presence of superfluid in the interiors of neutron stars. So that's by and large the property of the neutron star that I wanted to cover. I have already mentioned the star surface gravity is very strong. So when material, external material falls onto the surface, it will release a lot of gravitational energy and it, matter can become very hot. So for example, if a neutron star accretes material from a binary companion, then that material as it approaches the neutron star will get extremely hot and it will produce you know, you know, X-rays. So the two main forms in which neutron stars become visible to us are these pulsars, isolated pulsars, radio pulsars, and X-ray binaries. So between them, we. You know, can account for the bulk of the neutron stars that we see. There are, you know, obviously there are many neutron stars which are present in the universe, which are not radiating substantially for us to observe them directly. So there's a large population of dormant neutron stars which are also present, but those which you do see are mainly in this form, pulsars and extra binaries. I will stop here and then uh, take questions. Okay, thanks a lot, Dipankar. And uh, thank you for over the past three days for taking us right from the basics all the way to some quite advanced material. Uh, okay, so we have, I think, uh, yeah, close to half an hour for questions. So, yeah. um, so there's only two questions so far, but please, uh, I would encourage everyone to start adding questions here. Okay, uh, the first one is uh, from the YouTube live stream. Uh, is there an understanding of, uh, does one understand the transition from white dwarfs to neutron stars as a phase transition? Are there any effective 
field theory models for white dwarfs and neutron stars? It is more complicated than that. It is not just a phase transition because uh, you have a major nuclear transition. You uh, go from uh, regular uh, nuclear material, which is you know, basically A by Z of the order of one, uh, sorry, of the order of two, to um, highly neutron rich material. So um, uh, as far as the stellar configuration is concerned, it is not, it cannot be described by a simple phase transition because you, know, you may want to describe it as a whole series of phase transitions, right? You know, going from uh, neutron, uh, going from you know, regular material to neutron rich material, then going from you know, the you know, neutron rich nuclei to you know, you know, neutron drip, going from neutron drip to you know, Um, purely you know, neutron proton electron c these are all phase transitions of you know, you know, at various levels so there are multiple phases of material which exist inside neutron stars and you know, they are in equilibrium over certain regions of this density distribution and um, as you cross one density boundary to another you would see a transition to you know, other type So um, uh, it is not one phase transition. Let me put it that way. It's in number of phase transitions. Okay. Uh, effective thermal field theory models? <clears throat> no. Um, uh, you can describe equations of state. Um, uh, you can derive them from field theories, effective field theories. But um, uh, as far as white dwarf is concerned, the equation of state is very, very well known. And you, there is no um, uncertainty there. It's just a pure degeneracy pressure, which is you know, which does not require a field theory because uh, this pressure comes from uh, not potential energy but kinetic energy. Uh, but for neutron stars, you know, for nuclear interactions, you do need a field theory to you know, tell you what kind of forces uh, you know, exist, and people have built various field theories for it. Okay, uh, the next question. Is, uh, from the TOV equation, you mentioned that the mass limit is 0.71 solar mass, uh, assuming only neutron degeneracy pressure. How does one get the upper mass limit of uh, the neutron star to be 3.3 solar masses, theoretically? Yeah. So 3.3 is a limit. I will come to that in a moment. Okay. So uh, let's take... Uh, um, 0.7 solar mass. 0.7 solar mass, as I mentioned, is a limit that comes from pure neutron degeneracy alone. And we know neutron stars exist. We have measured their masses, which are one, one, one and a half solar mass or thereabouts. So clearly, pure neutron degeneracy is not enough to describe the equation of state of a neutron star. And you have to add the effect of nuclear forces. So once you have the effect of nuclear forces, then Using the nuclear forces, you can create an equation of state and take that equation of state and mm, use the same TOV equation now, but the equation of state is now altered from uh, pure Fermi mm, degenerate gas to Fermi degenerate gas plus mm, uh, nuclear forces. And whatever mm, uh, mass radius relation that you can derive from that using TOV equation will eventually lead to a measure of the maximum mass, a prediction of the maximum mass in that equation of state. So each of these equations of state has a different predicted maximum mass. As you can see in this diagram, we don't reach 3.3 in any of them. 3.3 solar mass is a hypothetical maximum limit, which <clears throat> derives from assuming that the speed of sound in the entire neutron star interior is equal to the speed of light. And you assume that mm, the speed of sound cannot exceed the speed of light. So that is what is called the causality limit, which is shown in this diagram uh, corner here. And mm, uh, when you go to a typical size of the neutron star, that will give you a maximum limit of our three solar masses. So <clears throat> the causality limit mm, mm, 
is around 3.3 times the mass of the sun. But you know, for all other realistic equations of state which have so far been proposed, using TOV equation, you can compute their maximum masses. They are well below 3.3. Okay, thanks. The next question is, are the glitches that you mentioned a function of the neutron star mass and or the period of the neutron star? Uh, it's certainly related to the spin period. In fact, it is more uh, um, uh, intimately related with the rate of spin down. So uh, this has been experimentally uh, um, uh, verified that uh, the faster the rate of spin down of the star, the more uh, frequent are the glitches. And of course, the spin down rate given a magnetic field is uh, related to its period. So it is related to the period in an indirect manner. Whether it is dependent on mass, there should be some dependence on mass, with all other things being equal. There should be some dependence on mass because the extent of the superfluid and so on is different. But experimentally, we have not yet been able to determine dependence on the mass of the neutron star of glitches because most of the pulsars for which we measure glitches, we have actually not measured the masses. Okay, thanks. Uh, the next one uh, is a little bit outside the purview of the lectures, but uh, feel free to take a shot. Um, so in case of compact stars, the degeneracy pressure balances the collapse. But in case of dark matter during the large scale structure formation, can dark matter collapse to a black hole? That's a very interesting question. Uh, the dark matter does not condense beyond a certain level. And that has to do with the kinetic energy that the dark matter you know, halos contain. So dark matter halos uh, start with a less dense configuration and you know, due to its own gravity, they start contracting, just like in, uh, we have seen in the case of stars. Now, I mentioned this at some point, that uh, if the star is condensed to, you know, the stellar configuration is condensed to a certain level, if you want to contract further, you need to disturb this balance. You need to take away the balance between the thermal energy, which is the internal kinetic energy, and the, the gravitational potential energy, right? That happens by radiation in these in, uh, gas clouds. So radiation takes away that energy and the uh, contraction can proceed. But the dark matter is not able to do that. So it comes to an equilibrium configuration where the kinetic energy of the dark matter particles balance the uh, gravitational uh, potential, exactly in real theorem. You, the same uh, twice the kinetic energy equal to minus gravitational potential energy, that is satisfied. If you have to collapse beyond that, you have to remove this uh, kinetic energy from interior. But dark matter does not radiate. So therefore, this energy cannot go out. So therefore, the dark matter configurations cannot collapse beyond a certain point, and they cannot directly produce black holes. Uh, the next one, next question, um, does the density of the neutron, is the density of the neutron star uniform in all regions, envelope and crust? Uh, I guess I'm not sure uh, where the I question thought is this asking. is what I showed here. Yeah. So this is density as a function of radius. Most of the core has roughly similar density, but it, the density drops dramatically from 10 to the power 15 grams per cubic centimeter to 10 to the 6 grams per cubic centimeter as you go from interior to the crust. So the density, uh, there is a density change by about nine orders of magnitude. Okay. Um, so that's all the questions that have been posted so far. Uh, but if you don't mind, maybe we can wait a couple more minutes to see more uh, questions. I'm happy to wait for a bit. Yeah. I'm sorry, I've not been able to attend the other talks. I'm, I hope everything is going very well and uh, people are enjoying the talks. Yeah, I think so. So far, um, yeah, I think it's, it's the, you're not the only one. I think uh, it's, you know, the, the original audience we had planned, uh, many of them are not able to attend for various mm -hmm. reasons. It's, it's also the timing is kind of close to when, um, you know, teaching starts mm -hmm. for many people. So it's difficult. Okay. okay. Uh, 
Okay, there is a new message. Uh, can dark matter be trapped in the neutron star core? There is no, no specific interaction that will no, specially trap dark matter in the neutron star core. I don't know about. All models that we have of dark matter are weakly interacting in, in, in particles. And in, those will not have any significant effect in uh, interaction with neutron star matter. One more question, this uh, reading aloud. Can there, can there be any way to define a, uh, define a transition from neutron star to black hole? I'm not quite sure, but I'm not sure we can define, we can describe maybe. So uh, we can, uh, so the neutron star, for example, you, you can have a neutron star like this, which is happily there and doing its thing. In a, if you don't disturb it, it will stay forever. Just like a white dwarf. A white dwarf, once it is formed, you let it be, it will be around for forever. But you do disturb them. For example, if you take two such neutron stars and merge them with each other. Then that's a major disturbance in the structure of the neutron star. And the total mass of the configuration after this merger could exceed the maximum mass that the equation state can give us. So in that case, the neutron star will eventually, uh, uh, this merger product will eventually uh, collapse into a black hole. So uh, in this process, you will emit a significant amount of energy. You will you know, probably emit a little bit of nuclear material, which you know, we think we see in the form of a kilonova. And uh, the energy produced in this collapse will you know, power an explosion, which you know, is most likely going to be a short gamma burst. So you know, there is a violent process that can happen if a neutron star does collapse into a black hole. You could produce a neutron star in the, in the, at the very edge of stability also, in principle, in the, from a single star evolution, where the, the star is held up beyond the, the maximum mass, which is the, given by this non-rotating TOV equation, the, by the rotation of the star the, and or the magnetic field which if it happens to be very strong. So this will be a configuration very close to the maximum mass, but higher than the maximum mass, because the additional energy density added by rotation and magnetic field is able to hold it up beyond that. So, but over time, the rotational energy could be lost. And if the rotational energy is lost, then the support goes and it can collapse to a black hole. And there again, you would expect some amount of, you know, energy in a, a significant amount of energy release and uh, possibly uh, explosion like uh, behavior. Um, one more question. I'm not sure about the superfluidity in the core of the neutron star. If it is there, then uh, how does one test if it is there or not? Okay, we can test that there is superfluidity in the crust, crust of the neutron star. That is through glitches. Whether there is a superfluidity in the core or not, there is no direct measurement of it as yet. It is possible that in some of these glitches, which are very, very uh, uh, large, uh, we will require the involvement of some of the core superfluid also in the glitches. But uh, that is a matter of uh, active current uh, estimation. Uh, we will know uh, with some more observation and, and uh, further theoretical exploration whether in some of these glitches, we are actually directly seeing the involvement of core superfluid. But in the crustal superfluid is, of course, there is no doubt about it. We see all the time. But the core superfluid in the, at the moment, in the, we do not have a um, definite direct information. Okay, thanks. Uh, so we have about seven minutes left. And again, I encourage uh, participants to post questions in the remaining time.
So while people are thinking of questions, I just wanted to remind uh, everyone that the lectures are being posted um, on the ICTS website. So I think the first two are definitely already there and maybe the third one also. So um, you can look, at, look over all the lecture material at your leisure, download it and uh, study it. So. Manjari, are there more questions on YouTube or um, just seeing if there's there any other no source of that question here. Okay. Okay. So while we are waiting, let me uh, thank all of you, Prashant, Manjari, and other. Uh, organizers for putting together this nice event uh, among all the constraints and uh, difficulty of doing the, all, everything online and so on. And also ICTS for uh, making all these facilities available and uh, having this program. So thank you all very much. And uh, thanks everyone for listening and uh, posing these interesting questions. I hope okay. This you find this useful. Yes, uh, no doubt. I think even for uh, people who've studied it before, it was very useful to see certain uh, you know subtleties here and there. So, thanks a lot. Okay, so I think we'll um, close here then. And uh, thanks again to Dipankar for uh, giving this lecture.